Let R be an integral domain. Suppose there exists a non-zero Y such that if we add Y to itself n times, n is an integer bigger than one, we get zero. We want to show that n times x is zero for all x in R. Now, first let's review definition of an integral domain. Here, R is going to be a set of two operations, addition and multiplication, and enough compatibility conditions between the two so that we have a ring. Usually, we're going to insist that there's a multiplicative identity one in our ring, and that the multiplication is commutative. The defining property for an integral domain, we're going to want that there's no zero divisors. So if we take two elements, A and B, multiply them together and get zero, that means either A is zero or B is zero. So if you have a product that gives you zero, that means you had to start out with one of your items equal to zero. Now, when we think integral domain, we should think in terms of the integers. Okay, it's right there in the title. Let's see what we get from having no zero divisors. Now, the point of no zero divisors is just that there's a cancellation law. So, if I had a group by the equation ax equals ay, we would multiply both sides by a inverse. a inverse times a is the identity. So this equation would reduce to x equals y. So the idea is I could just cancel those a's off. We have the same rule for an integral domain. The idea here, if I have ax equals ay, I move the ay to the other side, then I factor the a out. Now, that's going to be equal to 0, so that means either a is 0 or x minus y is 0. So if I insist on a being a non-zero element, then we have to have that y is equal to x. And again, this is this business of cancellation. So if I have ax equal to ay, a is non-zero, then you can just take the a's out. All right, see this in action. Okay, this isn't going to be heavy lifting, but it'll give you the idea. Okay, for the group, let's use, okay, we're going to have the real numbers minus zero under multiplication. I want to solve the equation 2x equals 8. Now, here we have multiplicative inverses, so I'll just multiply both sides by a half. That'll take out the 2, and then I'm going to be left with x equals 4. If we do this over the integers, I don't have access to multiplicative inverses. So the way we go here would be, we're going to move the 8 to the other side. I factor out a 2. We have 2 times x minus 4 is 0. 2 is not equal to 0. So that's going to mean that x minus 4 has to be 0, or x equals 4. So still have the cancellation law. We just get to it in a different manner. Now, let's prove our result. The idea here is not to just bang out a proof. We want to see how we get from our assumptions to our conclusion. So first assumption. I take y, add it to itself n times, we get 0. We're certainly going to need that somewhere. Then we have the integral domain property. So here we have no 0 divisors. So we take a times b equal to 0. That means a is 0 or b is 0. On the other side, we want to show if I take x, add it to itself n times, I get 0. That's for any x in R. Now, if we stare at this for a little bit, we want to find the middle ground from here to here. The thing that stands out is, here I have a sum of y's n times, here I have a sum of x's n times. So we want to figure out how we can get from one to the other. The middle ground is to take the sum of x times y n times. Now, we assume that we have a 1 in here, we could factor this thing as x times n ones added together times y. So you'll note, when I have it written out like this, it's pretty clear to see that I can switch the x in if I want, or I can switch the y in if I want. 
And that's gonna let me go from one side to the other. Now, once I've done that, we're gonna to wanna to be able to pull out the node zero divisor rule to force something to be equal to zero. Let's take a look at the proof. Now, what we wanna show, we're gonna pick our x from r, I want the sum of x with itself n times equal to zero. So we're gonna take that sum and I'll multiply by y. So that gets us to our middle ground step, the sum of xy with itself n times. Then I can factor an x out of the front. And since I have y added to itself n times here, we know that's gonna be equal to zero. So I'm left with x times zero and I get a zero. So that means this product here is equal to zero. And so since we have no zero divisors, either the sum is zero or y is zero. By assumption, y is non-zero, so that forces my sum to be zero. And that's our result. Now, integers, not gonna be a very good model for this situation. Okay, we never have sums of an integer with itself that give us zero, unless we're starting off with zero. So the model you wanna think of here is gonna be z mod p, where p is a prime number. Okay, and then this is gonna get you into the area of finite fields. Now note, something like z mod 10, where we're not prime, it's gonna be bad because you'll have zero divisors. So for instance, in z mod 10, if I was to take two times five, we get 10, I subtract 10 off, I get zero. So here, we're able to write zero as a product of two numbers that are not equal to zero.